Yeah, basically, um, if we go to the, the root of the human story, it's accepted that the first hominins, which are, again, hominins are humans, but it includes the early archaic humans, you know, such as Denisovans, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and uh, even earlier to the Australopithecines, you know, these all come under the hominin um, sort of grouping. Now that these hominins all emerged in Africa, and then way, way later on, around about around about two million years ago, that we have some of them, Homo erectus, that leave Africa, uh, and that they go on to evolve into Neanderthals and Denisovans. Whereas in Africa, a group that remains in place eventually becomes the first Homo sapiens, somewhere around about, now there's some, there's some disagreement on this, but somewhere around about 700,000 years ago or so, the line diverges from what is probably Homo erectus towards ancestral Homo sapiens. And that much later again, somewhere around 300,000 years ago, some of these early Homo sapiens begin to flow out of Africa uh, they supposedly uh, unsuccessful, they die off. And then there is a, a later wave, perhaps 120,000 years ago, which again are sort of unsuccessful. And at last, somewhere around 50 to 70,000 years ago, there's modern, fully modern, by this point, fully modern humans have uh, arisen in Africa and that they now move out into the rest of the world, replacing the archaic hominins that were already there. Now, that's essentially the the greater out of Africa um, theory. Now, within that, there's other, you know, other smaller theories, you might say, sort of sub theories, such as recent out of Africa, which focuses specifically on the sort of modern human story and, you know, the, how we ended up being throughout Eurasia, America, Australia, etc. You know, so that, that's a more specific subtopic. So that's supposed to be that more recent uh, date that you're talking about is right around 55,000 to 60,000 years ago. That's what we're focusing on mm -hmm. here. All right. So, yes. So yeah. we'll be tackling more the, the later you know, modern human story rather than necessarily the, um, you know, the flow of archaic humans. Uh, but I, sh I should add that I disagree with some of the earlier story as well in that rather than accepting that Homo sapiens emerged from a line of Homo erectus in Africa, I think it's far more likely that they actually emerged from Homo erectus outside of Africa, that were already out of Africa around two million years ago. Uh, indeed, it may even be a, a different hominin entirely, but as it stands, it looks to me that we should probably be revising the story as far back as two million years ago, just so that, to clarify that. I mean, I was um, schooled in the consensus um, hypothesis, you know, as everyone essentially is more or less, unless you have a very, say, religious view, um, everyone else comes to believe that, you know, that we have an African story that, you know, we came out of Africa, say, 60,000 years ago, give or take, say, 10,000. And that after that, there's this, you know, gradual spread across Eurasia, which ends with Australia and then America, right? So that I was familiar with that. And that was what I believed to be true for almost, you know, most of my life. Right. Um, and indeed, you know, I'm of recent African descent. You know, my my mother's side of the family were, you know, from slaves taken to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You know, so I had some level of personal, I suppose you say sort of personal pride in the fact that, you know, as, as a partly African person, that, you know, Africans were at the root of this modern human story. So, I mean, I certainly, if any sort of bias was there, I had a bias towards that narrative. So it, it actually took quite a, a strange flow of events to change my thinking. Um, back in 2012, I'd moved to Ecuador. And whilst there, I became involved in investigating a megalithic site in the Yanganatis National Park, which is a large area of swampy jungles in the eastern part of Ecuador, uh, which connects on you know, to the, the main Amazon jungle, you know, the right. part of the Amazon jungle. Now, within there, there is a, a strange a huge megalithic wall part of the construction that really doesn't fit well with any known cultures you know there's for example there's mortar on it which the aztecs didn't use uh, mortar in between their blocks mm -hmm. the the block style is reminiscent of some of the structures in peru with these uh, polygonal large megalithic blocks so again there may be some links but the the site itself is an area that wouldn't have been habitable in you know i, I i'm guessing in 
it, it could go back, let's say, well beyond 5,000 years, maybe to that 12,000, to when we had severe global changes underway. You know, it may have been, I think, around that time that a lot of this jungle didn't actually exist. And we sort of think of the Amazon jungle as being timeless, but that's not really true. And there's, there were points where large areas of it were actually savannas and stuff, right? So uh, I'm of the opinion that the structure would have likely been built before the jungle was there. Because, I mean, it really, it's not a hospitable area. I mean, there's swamps and, say, the, the extreme temperatures and all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't really want to build a big megalithic right. sort of site in the jungle there. Um, so I started looking a bit more into this. I thought, well, you know, who could it be? And really, the first connections I came to was that not far from there, there's a cave site where they uncovered the remains of some early Stone Age humans that are called the Lagoa Santa um, type people. Now, the Lagoa Santa are best known from Brazil, where there's actually a site, Lagoa Santa, right. who may go back uh, well beyond 20,000 years. I mean, there's dates at some sites down in Brazil that suggest 30, 40, maybe 50,000 years of inhabitation by these these people. Now, they have a particular morphology which suggests that they are not um, Asiatic, that they're actually more closely related to aboriginals and you know the oceanian aboriginal peoples right which of course is surprising you know because you wouldn't have expected to find aboriginal type people absolutely very early in brazil yeah that was going to be so my next question was uh mm -hmm. the, were these people did they have that denisovan uh, melanesian uh, genetic marker and um if they did then what are mm -hmm. some of the uh hypotheses out there of how they got there yeah, it, it does seem that I mean, there's a connection there because, of course, it's in Brazil, in the Amazon, that we find tribes today that are carrying this this unique signature of an ab a lost sort of Aboriginal population, you know, an Oceanian type population. Right. Um, that this is, I think there's at least two tribes that have a significant, you know, amount of DNA that has linked them to Oceania. And there are some other populations, I think, even in Mexico and elsewhere in Peru, where there are some some traces of this DNA, that it may be, you know, that there's not just these two tribes that have it, um, but certainly there's an anomaly there. And obviously when you've got Aboriginal type people's remains in Brazil, and you've got today modern tribes, isolated tribes who carry a signature of Aboriginal people, it, it goes together very well, right? So we not only that, and in fact, if you, um, if you look closely at the um, tribes that we're dealing with here, and I, I, I'm trying to remember the names, but it's gone from my mind for a moment, but yeah. one of them, they have a particular cultural overlap in that when they look to the sky, they see in the middle of the, the Milky Way, the dark, what we call the dark rift of the Milky Way, right? They see in that this huge flightless bird that mm. lives, you know, in their region, right? Which uh, I, Again, I'm not sure I'm going to get the right name for this, but it's, it's basically it's equivalent, it's a relative of the emu. Yes. Now, if you go to Australia and you, you ask the tribes what they see, many of the tribes there see a, a, a giant emu stretched along the dark rift of the Milky Way. Yes. Right? So what are the chances that you are going to find not only a genetic signature of Aboriginal mm -hmm. people, but traces of the same cultural thinking right down to looking at the dark rift and seeing this giant emu stretched along, right? Very so, small chances. Very small chances. Yeah. And then, and now, of course, we have these Lagoa Santa remains as well. So the case is becoming, I would say, overwhelmingly strong to the reasonable person that we have a very early migration that goes into the Americas from Oceania. Now, whether that's along the ice, from perhaps Tasmania, you mm -hmm. know, along the sea ice, and into um, Tierra del Fuego and up into South America, or whether that went round the top, you know, and they moved up out of northern Sahel, which is you know the greater Australasian region before mm -hmm. the sea level rises, that whether they moved out of there and, of course, took the Beringia route, but very early, 50,000 mm -hmm. years ago, that's possible. But I have to admit, I lean towards the sea ice model. I think that we probably had people that took advantage of the resources along the ice. And we know even today, of course, there are cultures that specialize in, you know, the, the resources you find on the ice, marine resources, uh, utilizing, you know, ice structures, you know, that you can live on it. Although to us, it sounds like, you know, horrifically hard life. 
there's, there's points when that may have actually been very beneficial, particularly in the ice ages when, you know, snow and ice was moving into your territory. You may have become very acclimatized. And so it wasn't so hard to flow further south, end up on the ice and moving along, following, you know, um, whatever game was there. Now, I'm not an expert on the um, the life there. I assume there's, you know, things like you know, walruses and, you know, the, obviously fish and whatnot that you can use, exploit these resources uh, move along the ice and end up in Tierra del Fuego eventually. Mm-hmm. And funnily enough, in Tierra del Fuego, the the early tribes that were there when they were first encountered, they actually have a number of overlaps again in terms of the culture. There's um, there's a number of rituals that they have where they they dress up, mark the body, and wear particular hats. These sort of T-shaped hats, which again you find among cultures in Aboriginal Australia, and these are the same T-shaped. Um, looking structures as you see at uh, Gebekli Tepe, for example, these these are T-shaped blocks. Right. But you actually have these on their hats. They'd have on top of their head a huge T-shape. Mm-hmm. Now, again, very strange to find the same hat being used by Aboriginal Australians as people in Tierra de Fuego. On top of that, the language of the people there, they had, it's reported, in fact, by um, Charles Darwin when he stopped in that region, that the people there had a very strange guttural language of, of we said, animal noises and, and whistles and stuff, which sounds an awful like a click-based language, right, With the, which has whistles, clicks, other mm-hmm. animal sounds. And you find that also in two other places, Aboriginal Australia and, of course, in um, sub-equatorial Africa, right? So but it's very, you know, it's, it's funny to find that you have, again, these overlaps. So there's a good reason to suspect that we have an entry from the south into the Americas by these people, they then spread, you know, upwards. And so Ecuador would have been very late on in that story. But I suspect that what we had is um, a group of these people moving up into the region, which is basically the sort of the well, central Ecuador. There's an area they're called, I don't know if you, um, the name of the nearest town, but um, essentially, yeah, anyway, there's a small town near to this site right. where, you know, there's, where there's other finds of these of these people you know up in the mountains in the area you've got mm. uh, ban sorry banos to agua santa if people want to look it up essentially in that town you know there's um, a few museums and there's other even a couple of the hotels they have you know collections of bones on display which have been found in cave sites in the town and, they, and they're labeled as lagoa santa type people so we know the lagoa santa type people were in the area and as i say there was a cave site near to the megalithic structure which contained mm-hmm. remains from these people so again if you follow the dots you think well who are these mysterious builders? There's a very high chance that it was the Lagoa Santa. Now, that is what led me into their story and to begin researching, you know, how could Aboriginal people end up being the first colonizers of the Americas, uh, perhaps 50,000 years ago? Mm. And how does that fit with the recent out of Africa story? Because I couldn't see how it did. 